a technical moment before we start and we're gonna start. A technical moment before we start and we're gonna start. I hear myself meaning that the uh, stream is on. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Rostrum number three. Uh, this is a panel discussion with uh, uh, globally recognized experts from different parts of the world uh, where we try to raise important topics uh, uh, relevant to everyone working in coffee. Uh, my name is uh, Jane Lesh, I'm from uh, Poland. And uh, I recently joined uh, a strong called community team. Uh, so I'm glad to present you the series of uh, educational and community events in the future. And today I have amazing guests uh, who are going to introduce themselves in just one moment. And we're going to be talking about uh, uh, quality control across the chain, meaning uh, uh, from cherry to cup, where is the quality? Where does it come from? Uh, just an organizational moment, uh, uh, dear uh, attendees, you see the Q&A session and you're welcome to uh, add your questions there. We're going to be taking them one after another. Some of them will be taken in written, some of them will be answered in the air. And uh, the chat is uh, uh, for everyone. Feel free to uh, write where you're from and uh, what do you do. So... I would like to start by introducing our great panelists today uh, and passing the word to Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim Wendelbo. I'm sitting in uh, Oslo in Norway at the moment, where we have a roastery coffee shop. And um, yeah, <laughs> I've been working uh, with coffee for over 20 years, roasting coffee since 2003. But uh, not. Uh, I opened my own company in 2007, so that's when we started importing coffee and roasting coffee, you know, like seriously. So uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you. It was humble and short, but <laughs> yeah. everyone in the world knows <laughs> Team Wendelbo. So thank you for our introduction and thank you for joining us today, uh, Ian. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ian. I am in Minneapolis and. Uh, I do the sensory analysis or direct the sensory analysis for cafe imports. Um, I've been at it for just about 10 years now. Thank you. Also pretty humble. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. Daniel, word for you. I'll try to be as humble as my <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Uh, so, hello everybody, my name is Daniel Velasquez. I'm sitting in Medellin, Colombia. I'm one of the co-founders of Amativo. Amativo is a green bean company uh, that has, we, we are in three countries, Colombia, South Korea, and China. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, here is where we're gonna start. Uh, we start with understanding uh, what is a uh, high quality cup of coffee. Like you have a cup of, cup of coffee, uh, in, in a, it's a great morning and you say to yourself, yeah, it's a really excellent quality cup of coffee. What would make it like this for you? What's, What's your quality cup of coffee? What are your um, expectations to a high quality cup of coffee? Then yeah, let's start with you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I will say that I'm not like active, actively thinking about, oh, is this gonna be a good cup of coffee? No, I prefer to have, for me, the good cup of coffee has that wow effect that you take this, the first sip and then you're just like, oh, this is good. Uh, so it's more like that, more natural. But if I think about why I, I, I like it, for me, the perfect cup of coffee, at least for my taste, is sweetness, balance, long after taste. I don't know, that's it. I don't, I don't ask for very exotic notes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, team, and for you, what is an excellent cup of coffee? Uh, well, I have to say the best coffee I drink is normally when I'm visiting a farm, drinking coffee from that farm. Um, but for me, uh, high quality coffee has to be sweet and clean. 
uh, no kind of defect uh, flavors, whether it's from roasting, bad brewing, or bad green beans. And if it has some character uh, where, so that I can recognize kind of where it's from, like it has to have some variety character and, and kind of terroir character. But uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, the most uh, expressive geisha or something. It, I, for me, it's all about that it's really clean, smooth, sweet, and uh, that uh, it has flavor intensity. Uh, it's just a bonus for me. Okay, thank you. Ian, and you, what's your uh, take on this? Uh, yeah, I can second with what both Daniel and Tim have said. Um, sweetness is the thing that stands out the most for me. And um, I differentiate maybe between the cup of coffee that I most enjoy and the, the coffees that um, I think technically deserve to be, for example, scored the highest, right? For me, a cup that I most enjoy is actually probably not a cup that's going to make me think I'm working when I'm at home. So if I'm at home enjoying a cup of coffee, it's going to be stuff that I'm not thinking about. And then I drink it. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh wait, this is a good one. And usually that has to do with it being sweet and clean and um, just pleasant as opposed to being really unique or really um, expressive or vibrant or way out, way out there. Wow, we, we seem to be in total agreement here. So sweetness and cleanness. And uh, okay, where does that come from? I understand that, uh, of course, there is brewing uh, that we expect not to be that uh, defected, right? So we just take brewing out of the table for the moment. And then we have a sweet, balanced, uh, uh, pleasant cup of coffee. And uh, we want to understand where, on which stages uh, of uh, its production from cherry to, 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 to the cup, uh, what did we need to do right to make it sweet and clean in the end? So we, we're just gonna start from the very, very end uh, with, with the roasting and roastery. So Tim, here is probably the question to you, <laughs> uh, your expertise mostly. Um, what are the uh, instrument of uh, quality control that uh, you think are uh, very important in the roastery? Well, uh, I think even before we start roasting a coffee, it's, it's very good to have a clear idea of what that coffee has to offer. Um, it's very often that I find people who are um, um, looking for attributes in a coffee that is never going to be there. Uh, so if you know the coffee, you kind of know what kind of flavor profile it has. So for me, I need to have a kind of sample roaster so that I can roast small samples. You know, it doesn't have to be a perfect roast even. It's just give me some ideas of what that coffee is about. And then I will roast it uh, a couple of tests on our big roaster. And in order to kind of see, get some numbers uh, from those tests, we typically measure, of course, temperature uh, and time in the roast profile curves. And we use Cropster for that, uh, which is a roast logging software, mm -hmm. but you can also use Artisan, I guess, or if, if the roaster already comes with the software, you can use that. And of course we use uh, just a weighing scale to see the weight loss of the coffee. So you weigh the coffee before and after roast. And uh, probably most importantly, uh, the color uh, measurement. We use a color track, but there are many different types of color measurements. Not all of them are very consistent. Uh, some of them will just measure one little small piece of your sample and not the whole sample uh, and average it out. So, but uh, I would say roast degree is extremely important. And uh, if you put that in combination with time and temperature, you start to get ideas of how to adjust the roast. So for instance, you can get to the same color by roasting the coffee for six minutes or 20 minutes, but the outcome is gonna taste very, very different. Um, so without measuring the color, it's really difficult to kind of know uh, what to adjust because if you're only going by time and temperature, uh, the color will change uh, even if you're trying to follow the same curve, especially on old uh, drum roasting machines. Uh, there will be variance because the green coffee is not always the same. It changes over time. The environment you roast in changes and so on. So I think, you know, those are the kind of most important quality measurements that you can do as a roaster. 
Uh, does it happen sometimes that uh, uh, the the batch was uh, somehow just didn't uh, fit the quality? So what do you normally do, and how how much doesn't <laughs> does it have to be not fitting the quality to actually withdraw it? Well, for us, it happens all the time, uh, and probably uh, we'll have a, a failed roast uh, maybe once a week or twice a week, sometimes more often. And uh, even though you follow the temperature curve and everything looked right in the roast logging system, and then you measure color, uh, it might be very different. And this, you know, it's not always uh, logical. It could be, you know, maybe the coffee you actually roasted was not the same coffee. <laughs> that's one thing. So that's why we have this as a quality control. Uh, but it, it could also be that, you know, when you're buying lots of coffee from a farmer, uh, it's difficult to get everything homogenized you know uh, because a lot of times it's one lot of coffee might be a mix of you know 10 different pickings that you kind of put together into a bigger lot and maybe they weren't mixed well before they were pack packaged and so on so um, there are many reasons why you can have a failed roast uh, of course we are human beings controlling the roaster um, so sometimes we do mistakes as well and uh, then it's really good to have these kind of measurements in order to you have a number for what what is right or wrong. So we have a window where the color should be within. And if it's outside of that window, we, we don't sell it as our Tim Wendelbaugh coffee. We pack it in one kilo bags that are transparent with no branding. And we tell the customer this is a failed roast and they get it for a discounted price. Nice, nice approach. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so most of the... Uh, um... Uh, let's make a step back and have uh, um, a look at the relation between the uh, green uh, supplier and the roaster, uh, where normally most of the roasters actually uh, still <laughs> buy green uh, from the suppliers, and it's, it's, it's great. Uh, here is a question. Uh, what is the quality steps that uh, happen between them in the relation, uh, meaning uh, the assessment of uh, green? Uh, do roasters assess the green quality when they receive the bag of coffee? Tim, do you do this in, in your uh, shop? Oh, sorry, you are uh, uh, muted. Could do you, you assess the quality please? of the green when you receive it to your shop? Oh, yes. Um, you know, we, for the main part, we buy green coffee from farmers that we have worked with for a long time. So when we get samples, I kind of already know how it's been processed and dried and so on. But we definitely measure uh, moisture content uh, and also water activity because different moisture meters will give you a different number. Uh, it's kind of like thermometers. Some will give you Fahrenheit, some will give you Celsius. <laughs> so, so you kind of need to know uh, your own moisture meter and uh, where it's at uh, compared to other moisture meters. And uh, that's why I use water activity as well, because that can kind of confirm if, if it's within that kind of window that I would prefer. And, and then of course you just look at the physical appearance of the green beans. I smell them. If I'm kind of in doubt, I would do a UV light uh, assessment. Um, but more importantly, we would also roast and, and taste the coffee. Um, and also see if there's a lot of Quakers in the roasted coffee. Uh, I think that's important as well. So that's kind of how I do it. And uh, when I buy a, a lot of coffee, um, I don't cup it just once. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you see these cupping tables where you have 10 cups of one sample and all 10 cups are cupped at the same time. For me, uh, because we buy coffee from a farmer that we kind of keep for a long time, uh, I, I like to kind of taste that coffee not just one day. I, I First, I taste it normally when I'm visiting them at the farm. Then I bring the sample back. I would roast it and I cup it once here in Norway. And then I'll leave it for a couple of days. I will cup it again. And then maybe cup it the next day again and compare it to other coffees as well so that I get a much better picture of what that coffee is all about. And sometimes, you know, you can go a little blind. Like if you only cup the same coffee next to each other, let's say it's 10 lots of the same variety from one farm. You kind of lose a little perspective of what the actual coffee quality is. So it's good to have something to compare it with, I think. And also, you know, one day I might be 
you know, slightly hungover or whatever, uh, which is not very good if you're cupping coffee. So uh, that's why I think it's, it's fair for the farmer to, to assess the quality more than once so that you can give a much bigger uh, or better assessment and feedback to them. Wow, I hope more roasters would approach it this way. Uh, Ian, from uh, Cafe Imports experience, how do you normally, uh, like what is the, the optimum and the maximum that normally uh, roasters do assessing the green that they receive from uh, from Cafe Imports? Oh, I'm sorry, can you? Do, do roasters uh, assess uh, the quality of green when they receive it from uh, uh, from the supplier? Yeah, lots of roasters do. Not every roaster does, but um, quite a lot of roasters do. And that, that kind of forms a, a, a basis for a lot of really fun and interesting conversation, right, between us and, and various of our customers. There's always, we can be using the same words and um, not quite be connecting. And where that comes is, I think, not from forcing people to uh, pretend to do the same exact thing, but to have these conversations and open up, oh, when I say this and then you say that, we're actually talking about the same thing and having a very similar experience. Um, that's really the, the human part. So when people are doing their own cupping, um, that really just opens up this whole plethora of new conversations that we get to have. Uh, and, and then it really then we really get into exploring what's quality for us, what's quality for you, um, what's really going to be the coffee that that fits the need that you're expressing and looking for. I see. And in your work, in your line of work, there's a bigger question to you. Uh, I understand that you need to uh, control the quality in many uh, different places, starting with the farm up to the uh, roasters that you sell it to. Uh, what are those spots uh, across the chain? As, as cafe imports, how do you try to ensure, how do you trace it? How do you try, it, try to ensure the quality along all the steps? Tell us a little bit more about your work. Well, um, there are lots of steps and they're not always the same, right? So sometimes coffee can take, similar to Tim talking about, uh, you can um, roast very differently and get the same color output. Well, you can send coffee through a number of different routes in order to get to us and then in order to get to the end roastery. Um, the, the places where we have actual control over the coffee um, really starts when we take possession of it at some, at some level. So um, to some extent, maybe when we're selecting and contracting through shipment, um, but even more so as it gets, you know, to our warehouse that we, that we own and operate that um, when coffee gets to our cupping lab where we control what happens to the samples, how they get handled, how they get stored, how they get um, analyzed, all of that. Prior to that, um, different people have different protocols. And what we do is we, we like to know what people are doing with coffee. And um, certainly I have my own opinions about better practices and worse practices. But we are, um, we're always very, very careful about um, imposing on, on our partners. Um, the, there are so many variables and there's so many different um, factors at play. The idea that someone might go in and say, well, this is the one way to do drying. This is the one way to do um, fermentation. This is the one way to do processing. I think is um, is misguided and and can lead to can lead to you know bad coffee and historically uh, not via us but uh, via other people um, we've seen that lead to people getting stuck with coffee as in someone comes in and says hey you should you need to do this and then the person does it and then the first person who asks that doesn't buy the coffee or the coffee gets messed up and no one buys the coffee that's a that's a real problem so. Um, to your question of ensuring what, what do we do to ensure uh, quality, we try to know what people are doing and have an idea about that. Um, and then we really kick in with what we might call just best practices, um, cool, clean, uh, and dry uh, through all of the actual uh, production chain areas that we, that we have control of. So that's you know, our shipping, our warehouse, 
um, our lab area. I see. Uh, whew, there's a lot to, to take from, from your reply, and I think we're going to come back to communication. There's going to be an interesting topic on this. Uh, Daniel, I want to uh, move to your side and uh, ask what are the good practices that uh, Nova Days, the uh, farmers and uh, uh, processing stations are doing to control the, the air quality? Okay, so here <clears throat> it's still a little bit complicated because you have so many farmers and Colombia's production system traditionally was like these really small farms and all the farmers doing everything. So the farmer was doing the, the agronomic part, the, the harvesting, the, the thinking about fertilizers, about the weather and then uh, fermentation and then drying and then warehousing. So our production, our traditional production system is the farmer does everything. What's the problem with this? I mean, for commercial coffee, there's no issue. But for specialty coffee, the problem with this is that basically most farmers, I will say 90% of them, don't have the infrastructure to do this properly, to do this as, as the specialty industry demands it. So that's something difficult because when you find a coffee grower that is producing good coffee and you want to work with that coffee grower, you immediately start having some consistency issues because so they're not used to store the, the, the coffee in grain pro bags, for example, just in, in, in jute bags. Um, so obviously something you need to explain, look, we need to store the coffee in this, in these bags because this way we, we control the, the moisture. And when you go and see where they're storing the coffee, it's just a dark, humid room. Um, so it, it's kind of difficult to, at some point you need to say, okay, let's do grain pro bags, but then when you start having enough, just ship it to my office or even we arrange the, the, the transport. So as, as I showed you in the beginning, this is a, just office and lab. Uh, we, whatever we, we ship, we ship it directly to the, to the mill. Um, start consolidating that there. So that's like the first thing. Okay, you have this traditional production system and you need to help them to, it's, it's really a partnership. Okay, this is what we need to change in order to have consistent coffee. And then there are another, farms, like medium-sized farms that people who maybe have more resources to do things as the industry demands it. So they're building uh, adequate warehouses and all this. So with them, it's easier. But those farms are not, I can count them, count them with my hands. Um, so what you, at the end, what you need to understand here doing quality control, and this is very difficult, is that there are so many things that could go wrong. So warehousing could go wrong. Even, even if some farmers, they, when they were uh, doing wash coffee, some of them have never cleaned the tank. I mean, it's, why will you clean the tank? Because for them, that's not fermentation. For them, that is just washing coffee. They see it like that. Uh, so you could have a lot of defects because of that. And so you, you need to start like analyzing, okay, where could things go wrong? And then start like working with the farmer in each step to ensure that at the end, the result is good and it's, it's gonna be consistent. But in Colombia, so besides that, you have risk at the transport. Uh, we have bought coffees in the farm that we cop, everything is good, but something happens in the transport. Uh, with the truck, weather, uh, one time I had a truck two weeks outside the port, the coffee at like at 35 degrees Celsius, it was crazy. So, the coffee lose some of its quality. So here in Colombia, you need to like 
fight against all those things that could go wrong. Uh, but it's part of the job. And it's actually an amazing part because you make, you feel like you're making this uh, uh, sweet and balanced cup of coffee, great one for many, many people who will enjoy it later on. So, uh, so. <laughs> I would like to take a moment back and for uh, those our participants who are uh, a little bit new to the whole chain because uh, uh, from our initial interview, I see that many are uh, barista cafe manager or young roasters or uh, just working uh, in a roasting site. Uh, let's try to uh, identify the longest way from uh, from from the bean to the roaster, like uh, including all these possible steps that can happen. So uh, there is a farmer, and then where uh, the farmer can deliver the coffee for uh, for um, processing or for post production? Uh, what can be the steps still on the origin, uh, Danielle, from uh, from Colombia experience? From the farm? Yeah, like where, whereas before it's exported, uh, where, what can be the pot possible steps? So there are many different paths that could follow here. Um, so the first path is the traditional one, which is the coffee grower does everything and produces parchment, at least in our more traditional product, which is we wash coffee, Colombian. Um, and then you just hire a transport, pick the coffee and take it to the mill. That's like the usual way to do it. Um, but lately and with specialty coffee, so we've seen some farmers that say, hey, I don't want to deliver the coffee in parchment. I want to mill the coffee. I want to select the defects because they have a totally different mindset. So their mindset is, okay, I, I'm, I'm growing these trees, I'm doing everything right with nutrition, then I'm trying to do everything right with processing. Uh, so they're like, I've done all this work and I'm not going to allow you to mess up in the middle. That's the way I see it and I love it. I love it, I, have, I love that mindset because they are like, okay, uh, I'm, I want to mill the coffee. Is it okay for you if you buy the coffee from me in green? And I'm like, sure, that's perfect. And even some of them take the coffee to the mill and they're there in the whole uh, dry milling process. So that's another way of doing it. It's not very common, but for me, it's amazing because obviously we pay them better for this because they're assuming all the risk from the farm to the meal to the final product. Um, and there are other ways uh, now with natural. So there are some associations that, I mean, you buy the cherry from them and you do the, the whole processing in, the, in, in, a, in a processing center, uh, but that's not really common here in Colombia. Uh, so those are, I will say, those are the two main ways of, of doing it. So then you as an expert in company, uh, where do you export uh, the, uh, the coffee? So our main market is China and South Korea, because as I said at the beginning, we have two companies there, one in Seoul, the other one in Shanghai. Um, so one, we, we we're four business partners. One of them is Korean, he's in Seoul, Mark. The other one is Mateo, he's Colombian, but he's more Chinese now than Colombian. He's in Shanghai. Um, so those are our two main markets because what we do is, obviously I export the coffee from here, but they import it there and they distribute it there directly to roasters. Uh, that's like 80% of our sales, but the other 20% goes to Chile, goes to Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, some to Turkey, uh, some to Spain. And those will arrive directly to the distributors who will distribute it directly to the roasters, right? Yes. So very different uh, model. Because, for example, when I ship directly to the distributor in some other country, 
uh, the, the relationship is very different. And, and the way I do things is very different than if I'm exporting to ourselves in China or South Korea. Of course. Um, and actually it's more, you feel more responsibility because in China and South Korea, obviously we want to do a very good job and we want to have the best coffee possible there. But if something goes wrong, I know that we're there and we, we can liquidate some lot or try to do something with that lot. But if I'm exporting directly to a distributor, that's not a possibility. I mean, there, there is no chance to fail there. So it's, the process is kind of different. Okay, I see. We will move here to Ian uh, and have a very wide uh, question. Uh, where do cafe imports take the beans? Like uh, how many, uh, like, it's not about percentage, but it's more about the experience. Uh, what do you scout directly from the farms? What do you have from, uh, from other sources uh, who already gathered it from the farms? Uh, or maybe you collaborate with some experts as well, uh, not being able to trace it back to the farm. How is uh, overall the sources of, uh, uh, of different coffees uh, uh, with you? Yeah, <clears throat> it, varies. it varies from origin to origin. Um, I would say that the majority of our work um, is from farm level, uh, where we're buying from, um, certainly where we're connected to the farms where we're buying our coffee. Um, there are locations where that is East Africa, for example, where that's very challenging, uh, where there is more of a, a washing station model. Um, in almost, well, in, in just about every case, we are working with an exporter of some sort. Um, and the relationships that connect um, via that exporter can, can vary, but um, overall, we really are, we really are working closely with uh, producers uh, as, as partners, um, getting to know them um, when we're not dealing with COVID situations, going to visit and, and setting up events, um, delivering coffee from our customers uh, that's been roasted back to uh, back to producers, so they can wow. see, you know, kind of see a range of oh, this is what happens, you know, this is kind of completing that completing that cycle or that circle, um, yeah. So. Majority, majority is um, transparent to that level. And as much as possible, that's, that's really what we're uh, looking to do and looking to be able to do. So from the quality perspective, here's where we come back again. And uh, this will be again, question to Danielle and to Ian uh, and uh, to team of course as well. Uh, how do we help to uh, improve the quality on the farm level? Would like to start here. Well, who do you mean by we? Yeah. Uh, Let me like, say, how do we help? Like in in your case, is uh, you cafe imports uh, uh, as a company, uh, and uh, since you buy the co coffee from the farm, you are interested in this as well. Um, in some in some cases, we've um, we've set up little experiments and trials. Um, in some cases, we've funded projects uh, for partners uh, at the farm level, uh, be that uh, building, building dryers, um, helping work on processing or processing equipment. Um, sometimes it's just suggesting uh, ideas. And in, in all cases, it, it, the, the generation is um, interest on the producer side. Right, as I was mentioning before, we, we really don't uh, impose, but we're you know we're open to having these conversations. And as soon as as soon as a producer is expressing interest, saying, "Hey, I want to try this," or "Are you guys interested in doing this?" You know, that's a great conversation to be having. Whether it whether it leads to a project or not, just having that conversation um, really opens up the relationship and allows us to. Um, take it to a kind of just a, a deeper level where 
we can have, then have conversations. Well, this is what we saw this year, and this is what we saw that year. Um, one of the big things in this larger quality question is, um, and it's been a little bit alluded to, is that we're dealing with an agricultural product. And um, so often I think that we get, we get lured into or infatuated with, oh, if we just do this one thing, it's gonna fix quality and we're gonna be good to go. Like the, the, magic, the magic recipe or the silver bullet kind of solution to everything. And so then we do it and God forbid, if, if it goes well the first time, then we think we hit on something. And next year when you know there's a, a rain at a weird point or it's dry at the wrong time or uh, something happens, suddenly the quality is not what we thought it was gonna be. Um, and so getting back to the question, one of the big things that we can do is we can, as buyers, we can be consistent, right? So it, it can't just be, um, oh, we want this cup quality and we're gonna do this thing and, and you're gonna do this thing and then we're gonna buy it. And if it doesn't hit the quality, we're not gonna buy it anymore. We need to be consistent over years to um, support the producer, but also to find out if um, the variable that we're trying to improve or control is actually uh, an important or functional variable. You can't find that out with just one trial or experiment. You can't find that out over just the course of one harvest season. You need to um, have some consistency, have that relationship, and and kind of you know stick it out uh, in good weather and 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 poor uh, over over some time so that you can really um, really get a sense of what's working and what's not working and um, essentially grow the quality of the coffee via the quality of the relationship that you have over the course of, of some years. I see, thank you. Uh, Daniel, from your experience, what is the biggest issue uh, in, in, in quality and quality control and the communication between farmer and, and the next partner? Um, so th that's a big deal, communication. Um, and not only communication on expectations on quality, but also communication about how everything works. Uh, this might seem simple, but I, I think Ian knows this, but at least in Colombia, uh, we have the Coffee Growers Federation and whatever wash coffee the coffee growers produce, the, the COBs and, and the Coffee Growers Federation through the COBs will buy that coffee. So it's, it's a guarantee that that coffee will be purchased. Um, so the thing is, so that's the first thing you need to understand when you come here and you want to set a relationship with, with a farmer, uh, well, you need to kind of break that past mold of how to do things. Um, the second thing is you need to understand the limitations as Ian was saying. So uh, if you come here and you start, hey, let's do this and let's do this and let's do this. One, the farmer might not have the equipment of, or the knowledge to do that. And second, if you ask him to do, for example, a natural, if you later don't like that natural and you don't buy it, there's, there is absolutely no chance he's going to sell that coffee to somebody else because few companies here buy naturals and the Coffee Growers Federation don't buy naturals. They don't, they don't buy natural. So at the end, the farmer has that and what, what I'm gonna do with this. So I think those are the things. And now if we go to the roasting part of, the, of, the, of this, there are so many things. I was mentioning you yesterday. Um, so first thing is most farmers don't have a facility to do quality control. So thankfully we have something here called Sena, which is a public school and they teach coffee and they have labs and, and they, they, they borrow you or they lend you these labs to, to do your quality control. But the farmers that know how to use them or even know that exists, 
just minimal. Few of them know that exist. So what happens is that when they start doing experiments, because they say, oh, specialty coffee, and, and, and they see like a, a way out in specialty coffee, and they get excited about it and they start doing processing, but then they are not, cop they are not coppers, they are not roasters, so they do a bunch of stuff, and they're like trying to find someone to, to assess the quality of these coffees. And when they find someone that's, I mean, in Colombia, we don't have many good roasting machines. I mean, we have the roasting machines we have are not very advanced, except for this one. Uh, but I, I mean, in Colombia, there are just four stronghold machines. And obviously we have some products and all these, but, but most of the roasting machines are not very good quality. So what happens is that when the farmer roasts their, his coffee, in, so the result in, is not always good. Uh, and I've seen some coffees that I cut them, I'm like, nah, this coffee is not good. But then I roasted, I asked for some green and I roasted, I'm like, this coffee is great. Uh, so what I've seen is that most of these great coffees don't make it to the foreign market because we have a limitation here with quality control. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is when, when they, and for example, the, the farmers who have bought the stronghold machine here, they, they have bought it for one reason, which is when you're doing processing, you're managing so many different variables in the farm, in the processing. So you're dealing with weather, you're dealing with pH, we're dealing with mass, we're dealing with a bunch of stuff. And when you're trying to improve a coffee, you, you basically what you're doing is, okay, I'm moving this variable here, I'm moving this variable here, and you try to do it in an organized way, kind of scientific way. But then when you get to the roasting part of it, that's, that becomes another variable. Uh, it becomes, it should be a constant, but becomes another variable. So at the end, the farmer doesn't know if the coffee improved or not because of what he did at the farm or because of the roasting part. Mm -hmm. um, so with the farmers, we have worked with, with the with stronghold machine. What they've been doing is they have a standard profile for a specific coffee. And then if they want to start like twitching and moving variables in the fermentation of that coffee to try to get a different result, well, they use that standard roasting profile as a base to understand if things change because what they did at the farm or or it's or they need to improve something. So it's so, work in progress, right? Yeah, I mean here it's been very useful. I think honestly, when I talk to some of the farmers, I would like them to take the machine to their farm. <laughs> Because I feel like for me, it, it works here because I can program some profiles automatically, but I receive so many samples that I feel like I'm not getting the 100% use of the machine. Uh, but for some farmers, it's been good because of what I was explaining. I see. Tim, I would like to move here for, to, to you. Uh, in your long experience, uh, what was uh, your um, approach to buying coffee and uh, your experience with the farms and why moving yourself to have a farm? Well, uh, it actually started with, uh, I mean, I started as working as a barista and um, I early started competing in barista competitions. And uh, I, I was fortunate that I was able to test a lot of equipment for the company that owned the coffee shops that I worked for. Uh, so they would place new equipment there all the time and I would test it. And, you know, the more I tested, the, uh, you know, I, then I kind of figured out which grinder was good, which machine was good and so on. And then at some point I realized, you know, I couldn't get the espresso to taste any better. So then I started researching roasting because i figured you know 
the roasting wasn't consistent. So then I kind of got into roasting and I started testing and testing and testing. And I came to a point where I felt like it was not necessarily the technical aspect of the roasting holding me back anymore. It was the green coffee. So, um, you know, uh, one very good example is that I, when I opened my own company, I bought some Cup of Excellence coffee. And uh, in the beginning, that coffee tasted great. And then all of a sudden, it didn't taste so good anymore. And, and uh, I thought it was the roasting. But uh, then, you know, the more I learned about green coffee, then I realized, you know, the coffee had become woody. And uh, it was kind of out of my control. Um, and then uh, I started traveling to Origin, uh, basically, because I wanted to know that if I paid good money for coffee, I wanted to know that the money went to the farmer. That was kind of the first intention of starting to travel. But then I realized that uh, a lot of times good quality coffee happens by accident. And what I mean with that is that you go to a farm that has an excellent coffee and you see how they're working and there's nothing systemized. I mean, that's not the case for all farms, of course, but, uh, in my early experience, that was very often the case. And one year to another, the coffee that tasted great one year would taste, you know, terrible the next year. So um, the more I kind of traveled, the more I started to put all these pieces in the puzzle together and see, you know, in Kenya, they do drying on drying tables and the coffee stays fresher for a longer time. They wash the coffee in a certain way. It's very, always very clean. Uh, and you know you kind of start to make sense out of things so when I started kind of building relationships with farmers then we uh, over the years we have kind of uh, developed together and, and done a lot of experiments and based on the results of, of that kind of created a protocol that each farm will follow and of course each farm is different so you have to kind of adapt to their situation and, and make protocols that are different uh, or perfect for each farm and um, so that's how, kind of how it started for me like it started at the at the consumer end so to say like I was making coffee and it wasn't good enough so I had to research was it the equipment and then I figured it was the roast and when I, I was roasting I figured it was the green coffee and now when I'm working with the the farmers I you know the more we kind of worked on the process and drying and we got the coffee to taste extremely clean. The drying is done very carefully. So the shelf life is much longer. The storage is much better now. We're storing in cool conditions in grain pro bags and all these kind of things. And then you realize, you know, we can't get this coffee to taste anything better. Uh, maybe we need to change varieties. So now we're actually trying to get seeds to all the farmers we work with and plant seeds. Once the seeds are planted, it takes, you know, three or four years before you have the first picking. And then you pick maybe one or two years, you taste the coffees, you select the better ones, you plant more of those. And then normally it will take around 10 years before you have a decent production of a new variety. So for most farms that I kind of buy from and work with, we have done that for a couple of years. And we're kind of in the fifth, sixth and seventh year of developing new varieties. And by saying new varieties, it's not new. It's like, for them, it's new, but it's seeds that are kind of well-known like Bourbon or SL28, or, but it's not traditionally grown, for instance, in Colombia, where most of the farmers are growing Castillo and Catura. So a very good example is, uh, I think, Atamana in Colombia, where I'm buying coffee. We, I think we now have close to 20 different varieties planted. And we recently started buying a couple of them because the volumes are big enough so sl28 and bourbon and they are tasting much better than the traditional varieties uh, but then you have to also be careful because the farmer can have problems with varieties like this with leaf rust you know uh, so you have to always consider the farmer's economics um, and what's sustainable for them because you can plant something that tastes fantastic but if the production is low and uh, you have a lot of leaf rust attacks on the trees, you know, the, the farmer will lose money, which is not what you want. So the fundamental part of being able to work like this for me is the commitments that I make to the farmers saying, uh, I'm going to buy this amount of bags and we're going to pay a minimum price for it every year. And uh, once they know that, then it's up to them if they're willing to kind of risk uh, experiments and so on so um yeah i think 
for me, uh, I'm not sure if I even ask, answered your question, but that's kind of how I, I came about working with farmers. And it kind of started, at, uh, as I said, in the, in the wrong end. And I worked my way backwards. And now, now we're back to all the way back to planting the seed. So, uh, and of course, on my own farm, I'm also working on improving the soil, which I think uh, is crucial if you want to have a high quality. And we already have some indications that uh, it is actually working, um, although I'm not producing a lot of coffee. The coffees that I have produced, which is 320 grams so far, <laughs> um, those coffees actually taste really good. And uh, I can compare them to Elias's coffee because some of the varieties that I grow are seeds that I've taken from his trees. So they're com comparable and we're side by side. So it's, it's easy to compare the quality. And when you were considering where to start with uh, uh, having a farm, why Colombia? Well, Colombia is unique. It's amazing. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Colombia is unique. I mean, uh, uh, there are so many different areas and great climate. If you kind of look at the map, it's kind of situated the same uh, area as uh, East Africa, like Ethiopia and Kenya, where kind of coffee is from. Uh, but the, the most important part was the person, uh, Elias, who had the piece of land that I bought, uh, that I'm also buying coffee from. He's a fantastic person and that I, a person that I can trust 100%. And uh, when you have a farm and live in, in Colombia and you live in, in Norway, then uh, you need people to help you in order to run the farm and take care of things. So that was by far the most important, uh, you know. It, Ideally, maybe I would dream of having a farm in Ethiopia or something like that. But um, for me, I think Colombia is a great challenge as well because uh, most of the farmers are growing the same varieties. Um, most of the farmers are kind of doing more or less the same processing and so on. So I think it's a good place to, to show other farmers or inspire other farmers that there is a different way of doing things where you can add value to the coffee. So that you're kind of not depending on the sea market and all these kind of mechanisms that you can't control. So I hope to be able to inspire farmers to, to both grow coffee in an organic way and, and also maybe try new or different varieties where the focus is more on quality and not necessarily high yields and so on. But uh, I have to put a disclaimer that it's not working so well for me at the moment. We have produced 320 grams in five years. So. <laughs> not a very good result. No, but um, it's actually, uh, my trees are actually flowering at the moment and there are some uh, cherries on the trees. So hopefully we'll have a small little harvest that we can actually serve the coffee or sell the coffee next year maybe. <laughs> At least you have your hands full till uh, uh, you're retiring. And I know uh, where you're going to be retired. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> That's nice. I, I, will, I would like to add something to what Tim just said, which he, he, I mean, he thinks he's inspiring farmers and maybe that's the case. But for me, the most important thing is that he's also inspiring roasters and baristas and coffee shop owners uh, to, to do what he did, to come here, uh, see what it's all about, to meet the farmer, uh, understand the limitations, but also the potential. Because in, in, specialty, in the specialty side of the business, we tend to meet each other at the middle. So I'm here, I'm trying to do different things, but in the middle, I need to meet with someone willing to, to do their part in the foreign market. And with all the customers we have, that has been a constant. They have been very interested in coming here, in understanding, in trying to build relationships. For me, it's amazing because when I talk to them, I talk on WhatsApp. I chat with them on WhatsApp like if they were friends and they are friends. And for me, that's pretty cool because they're always asking for pictures, asking, hey, how's the farmer doing? So I think that 
it's I understand team intention was to inspire farmers here, but I've seen not the opposite, but I've seen that it has worked uh, both ways, also inspiring baristas, roasters, coffee shop owners. So that's amazing. And I think that's something we need to improve our industry. Thank you. I want to uh, want to raise another very important topic uh, that uh, Ian brought uh, in in his speech before is uh, uh, the communication, the way we talk about each, uh, the way we talk to each other about coffee, describing the coffee, and so on. Because we expect, uh, like from 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 the experience that you just mentioned, we expect to talk uh, like uh, the uh, uh, farmer talking to exporter, or farmer talking to importer in a different country or experts are talking to importer before uh, the container is out. And then uh, we've got uh, as a green bean supplier talking to roaster and then roaster talking to a coffee shop owner or barista. And we still talk about the same coffee, but we, we what kind of words we are using? Like, uh, is it important that everyone across the chain is just like a Q grader license uh, or, how, how do we even talk to each other having that uh, different uh, sensory background and that different tasting experience? Uh, what's your experience in, in uh, and how would you comment on, on actually issues in communication? Jan, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, well, I think this, this gets back to a little bit of what we've talked about. Um, so, the communication thing, the thing that's really important, I think, is is the relationships that support and surround the communication. Um, similar to the idea that maybe we're going to get one piece of technology that's going to solve all of our problems, uh, there seems to be also maybe an idea that we're going to get um, one cupping methodology or protocol and everyone's going to do that and it's going to solve all of our problems. So if everyone is just a Q grader, maybe we would all suddenly be on the same page and scoring within a quarter point of one another and using the exact same words and et cetera. If you've ever been part of an international cupping jury though, you realize that um, setting, even setting aside things like, oh, well, we have certain foods and fruits here and uh, Daniel has certain fr uh, foods and fruits in Colombia, and Tim has certain foods and fruits um, growing up in Norway. Sure, we're going to have different associations when we try to talk about berry or um, other fruit flavors. But so we can set that aside. Even when we talk about what is sweet, even when we're saying, is this a sweet coffee or is this a sweet coffee? When you participate in an international jury, you realize that even something so objective and not, not aromatic, but actually just uh, base taste level, people have um, significant variation, right? So um, I grew up associating certain things with being sweet and certain other things not with being sweet and so did everyone else. And so um, all of that to say that the, the challenge of communication is is not something that can be fixed by just designating, oh, well, from here on out, this particular, you know, this is lime from here on out. Everyone in the world just needs to get themselves some LaCroix lime sparkling water. And then we can all agree that that's lime for forever. That, that's, that's just not realistic. We could do that within cafe imports, right? We could use that kind of a reference within a company and decide that's what we're going to reference when we talk about Lyme. Um, but when we then go and cup with Daniel or Tim, when we, when we meet up in Colombia and taste some coffees, we're going to have to do that process all over again and have a conversation. Oh, you said lemon, I said lime. Oh, you said, um, you said pineapple and I said orange. And that, that lexicon thing, that lexicon building process is, um, it's local. And local means when we're in the cupping room, we're going to have a conversation, we're going to taste coffee, so we're going to decide, this is what we mean when we say this. This is an example of 88. This is an example of 94. This is an example of um, 76. 
we're going to come to agreement and then we're professionals. So we can do that. We can say, oh yeah, okay, I'm tasting this. Normally I would consider it lime, but we've had this conversation. So this is lemon and we can, we can make those adjustments, right? So I don't think again, that there's a magic bullet or a, a secret code. I think that the secret is that we actually just have to have these open conversations and um, actually taste coffee together and then actually discuss what we're tasting and have relationships and um, and like Daniel was saying, we then, and then we meet, we meet in the middle and um, my conversation, my meeting in the middle with Daniel over quality or flavor can be different than how it is with Tim. And that's fine. And Tim and Daniel can have a different one than they have with me. And that's also fine as long as we're having that conversation and are able to actually communicate uh, and share experience. Cause that's kind of, that's really what we're doing. We're trying to, we're trying to share experience. I've got this coffee here and I want to share the experience of what it is with Daniel or with Tim uh, or with Eugene. And it doesn't have to be the same exact words or numbers or whatever it is that we're using to communicate. It needs to be the words and the numbers uh, that work. Okay. It needs to be things that allow you to say, oh yeah, I, I know what Ian's talking about now. That makes sense to me. And now you can make a good decision. And now you can. I, water. I had it once. So. <laughs> Tim, how do you communicate about uh, uh, the flavors and about describing coffee to uh, to the farm? Well, uh, uh, when there's no COVID uh, situation, I normally visit the farms once a year or twice a year, depending on which farms they are sometimes more. And uh, in most cases where I work directly with farmers, we would cup the coffees together. Uh, some of them are not cupping, you know, on a regular basis, but they still come to the lab, they taste the coffees, and then we kind of talk about the coffees. I would also cup it together with an exporter normally, uh, or in some cases. And then we kind of sit down and discuss the scores and the, the quality. I th think the farmers are sometimes very hung up on the actual score like did I get 87 points or 84 points but um, what they sometimes don't uh, understand just by looking at the score is that for instance an 87 point Kenyan coffee is a very different quality than an 87 point Brazilian coffee for instance I, for me it's kind of like two different categories it's kind of like scoring dark beers or light beers or you have dark beers and white wine you know they're two different beverages that have this kind of own references so so for me giving a, a cup score is is not enough normally what i like to discuss with the farmers is uh, once kind of all the coffees are cupped then we can get a better picture of uh, if they've done a good job with the processing and drying because there can always be one coffee that is spectacular and one that is you know completely defect but uh, I think what's more important is consistency for the farmers and if the average score is higher one year than the other then uh, it might be because of climate or something but it can also be small subtle changes that has been done in the process and that the farmer needs feedback on so very good example is uh, Moises Herrera and Marisabel Caballero that I buy from in Honduras and uh, the last season they they changed their mill a little bit, uh, the setup for the mill. So they started fermenting the coffee slightly longer. And uh, we did actually, without me knowing this, we did actually taste a little bit more fruit flavor in the coffee in a positive way um, overall for, for all their coffees. And when we kind of discussed that at the end, uh, he could reveal that, you know, now we are, we are actually fermenting a little bit longer. And uh, we, we saw that the quality was a little bit higher. So um yeah i think communication is key and uh, it's not like uh it's only my opinion normally uh, a farmer will also deliver coffee to an exporter or try to sell their coffee to other people and you know they will get feedback from many different people and uh i i find that most of the times people are quite calibrated unless there are some crazy coffees on the table like anaerobic whatever then you will for sure normally get a very low score from me and and a very high score from, you know, 
a competing barista or something. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? I would actually go into this uh, for a moment as well, uh, asking, a, asking it in a different way. How do we communicate to uh, producers what's uh, uh, what's hot on the market, what uh, people are looking for, what buyers and rosteries are looking for? How to explain that there is a certain demand on different uh, uh, fermenty, heavier coffee that actually is, <laughs> I would say, overall. Uh, do you guys do communication like this at all, ever? Or you just uh, approach the, uh, the farm and the producers the way they are and just uh, have, it, have it the way it is? And I, I personally will always ask prior to the harvest, I would always tell the farmer how many bags that I'm looking to buy and what kind of process that I would prefer them to do for those coffees. And for me, in most 99% of the cases, is washed coffees. But uh, uh, I have discussed with, for instance, Elias in Colombia to, to do small amounts of honey, natural process, and to try to offer them to clients that are interested in those. And he has found clients that are now on a regular basis buying naturals, for instance, uh, for a very good price. And uh, for him, it's also a timing wise in a time of the year where most buyers are not buying coffee. So for him, that's a very good thing. But I, I think it's very, very uh, important that you as a roaster don't encourage the farmer to do all sorts of crazy things. And then you end up not buying it. Like if you ask a farmer to do something, you have to commit to buying it, or at least be very clear that, you know, if it doesn't turn out well, I will not buy it, you know, so that it's up to the ro uh, farmer to take the risk if they want to or not. But uh, I think, uh, I, I think most people are quite good at this, but I've also seen examples where, you know, uh, companies will go in and say, we want special preparation on these and these varieties, and then they end up buying nothing. And then the farmer has spent a lot of time and money on on coffees that they can't sell, which is what Daniel was talking about earlier on. Mm -hmm. I think Ian also mentioned it. Uh, Ian, how do you come uh, communicate to, to, to producers what's, uh, what's hot on the market, what roasters are looking for? Yeah, I, I am not aware that, um, that we do that. Meaning, um, if, if anything is currently hot on the market right now, I would, I would uh, assume that we're going to be talking about uh, yeast, yeast uh, fermenting and anaerobic fermenting. And uh, to my knowledge, we are not going to people saying, hey, you know what? If you do this to your coffee, that's, this is what's hot on the market right now. Um, as, as I understand it, uh, people are coming to us saying, hey, we've got this anaerobic fermentation. We've got this uh, yeast process, uh, would you like a sample? And, um, to, you know, to, to a little bit of what Tim was mentioning there. Absolutely. If, if we are going and saying, Hey, we'd like to try some natural coffee, um, to a person who's not making natural coffee, uh, that advances exactly when we say, and it's, we'd like this many bags and we're going to buy it. And, that's, you know, that's it. The risk is now on us. We're going to ask you to do this. We're going to buy it. Um, we have, you know, we've done that. We've done that with natural coffee in, in Kenya, for example. Um, and you just commit to buying it and you, and you buy it and you get what you get and hopefully it works out and hopefully it gets better and better and better. Um, but sorry, back to your question. I actually don't think that we go to people and say, this is, this is the trend right now. Uh, you should do this. So it's mostly the opposite to the other way around. Yes. Daniel, here I will rephrase the question to you. Uh, from what I'm hearing, that uh, uh, Colombian producers are the most uh, like innovative and open to different experiments and uh, uh, well, producing all sorts of coffee, all sorts of fermentation, all sorts of quality. Um, how would you uh, describe uh, uh, where is it taking the influence and uh, why are they experimenting that much and how sustainable is this? How repeatable are those experiments? Okay, uh, so the first thing is I agree with Tim and Ian that 
even us here in, the, in, in, in Colombia, um, even us that we're always visiting the farms, we don't, we don't tell the farmers what process to do. We don't tell them, look, this is hot in the market. You should do this because if you, if you want to do it right, uh, if you want to do it well, then it, that takes time. It takes development. It takes commitment. If you want to do this crazy yeast anaerobic process, whatever, uh, you won't get a good result the first time. It might take you two or three years to get to a, a good profile. So that's a commitment, that's a risk. That's why we don't tell the farmers, hey, you should do this. Actually, I, for me, it works the same as with Ian. Uh, people tell me, hey, I have this process. And then we copy it and we analyze it. And, and then if the farmer keeps trying to improve that process, then we start doing like QC for them. That. Um, so that's, that's the way it is, with those processes. And now what I will say is, I don't know if Colombians are very innovative or open-minded, but what we are is very intense, obsessive, drastic. Uh, so people hear about, oh, this anaerobic is selling well in this country. And now everybody's just crazy about doing it and, and experimenting and it's just crazy. So when I, it's actually themselves sharing this information. You don't have to <laughs> <They're like laughs> themselves. Oh, it's 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 impressive. It's impressive. Actually, if I tell you what was he what was being produced here in Colombia five years ago and what is being produced now, it's just mind blowing. Five years ago, the most advanced farmer was talking about naturals, about honeys. Four years ago, I was talking about naturals and then black honey, red honey, yellow honey. But now people are talking about yeast, uh, lactobacilli, culturin, uh, anaerobic, aerobic, Carbon, anaerobic, anaerobic, yeah, carbonic maceration. <laughs> it's just crazy. Look, like five years ago, I was perfectly capable of going to a farm and just understanding everything and saying, yes, yes, you should do this, improve this. Now, there are some farmers that they talk like, like I don't know, like chemists. Oh, did you say chemist? Yeah. yeah. But like always in, in, in their language is pure chemistry. Oh no, and then you this and then the sales. And I'm like, <laughs> when did this happen? So I will say that's Colombia. I, I don't know if that's sustainable, because for example, when geisha became a boom, so everybody here, or not everybody, but a lot of people here decided to grow geisha. And not like, oh, let's grow 500 trees. No, it was like, you know, this big farm I have of Castillo, like tear it all down and let's just put geisha. So now you have some farms that produce a container world of geisha <laughs> and we, we that we're on the market we understand that geisha is popular but sales of geisha are not really big like to sell containers of geisha so how sustainable it is it might be some for some stuff like processing for other stuff like just floating the country with geisha i don't know how how sustainable is that? Because at the end, it's more expensive to grow geisha. It's more expensive to take care of the tree uh, compared to a castillo. It's more difficult to handle it. So, and then when you have a lot of geisha, the price goes down. Uh, so I don't know, but what I will say is we're very intense and drastic about everything. <laughs> That's Colombia. And I wanted to, if you allow me, I wanted to say something about what Ian and Tim were talking about communication and copying that I believe is important. And it's important for, especially for people here in Colombia, but also for the roasters there. When we started, uh, you think that what you like here 
or what you enjoy here, everybody in the world will like that or will enjoy that. Uh, so if this tastes good for me, it, it probably tastes good for everybody. Um, so when we started, we were just like not having the good communication with the roaster. And when I was speaking coffees here, I was speaking very conservative coffees, very conservative profiles. And then every time I was going to South Korea, for example, uh, one, one time happened to me that for, for, by mistake, I sent a sample of a natural coffee I didn't like. And I didn't like it because it was very funky. Uh, I, I think Tim wouldn't like that coffee. Uh, <laughs> it was very <laughs> funky. And my, we put it on the, on the cupping table and I realized it was on the cupping table too late. So I was like, ah, this was a mistake, but okay. I didn't want this coffee here, but And then I was copying and I tasted the coffee and I was like, yeah, I don't like this coffee. But then everybody was like, oh, this coffee is so good. This coffee is crazy. I couldn't believe it. I was like, why? And they were, they were explaining me what they liked about that coffee. And it made perfect sense because for what they eat. If, if you go to South Korea, they like very funky, fermented stuff. So for them, that coffee was amazing. And I had to understand that. So I think that to achieve good communication, we need to, as Ian was saying, we need to talk. We need to sit down and talk. And we need to, if you're selling coffee from Colombia or from another country to the, to the uh, consuming country, what we usually be doing is traveling there, hopping there, and talking to the people there because that will help you to understand what kind of coffees you need to source in your home country. And the other way around, if the roasters don't come, they might miss some coffees that we discard because we think that the consuming country won't like. But when they come here, they try and they say, hey, why are you, are, are you buying this coffee or exporting this coffee? And I will say, I don't think people would like it. And that person will tell me I love this coffee. So you need to do that thing. You need to, to talk I both see. ways. So getting back to, to the world of roasters who do not normally travel to the origin, who do not uh, sit with the farmers, uh, do, do not really get feedback to the farmers directly because they just don't have access to it, uh, who mainly only interfere with uh, green bean suppliers. Uh, but they always want to do something special for their customers. They want to, once they buy like an aerobic, second time they buy an aerobic and it's a different one. Uh, they don't understand what it is. Uh, many rollsters still uh, write uh, the taste uh, notes on their bags, which they get from the taste notes in the green supplier, which is not necessarily the, something that will be in the cup after their style of roasting, after the style of brewing. So uh, getting back to uh, roasters who buy and roast coffee, they have their piece in, in the chain. Uh, what would you advise them to uh, pay attention to? How to uh, uh, select a great coffee, how to make it even better tasting for the clients, and what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to? Uh, does everyone uh, need to travel to the farm to understand uh, what's going on or where does it need to take uh, the education? Just a, a, a round of your uh, last uh, word for today for the roasters. What would you uh, advise them to do? What, what does it need to do to make the great part in this chain? Who would like to start? Tim? Yeah, I can start. Uh, well, first of all, I would... Uh, look for uh, transparency. I think without transparency, there's no way of knowing whether the farmer was paid well, whether the quality is actually as good as the seller says it is. So uh, I would actually look for uh, whether it's importers or exporters or farmers who are transparent in the way they do trades. I think that's the most important part if you want to 
be able to support farmers and make sure that they will be able to grow good coffee also in the coming years consistently. Um, it's, it's hard to assess quality if you don't have any good reference. So for instance, if I was relying on buying coffee from importers, um, it, I think it, I would uh, contact several importers. And let's say I would, I'm going to buy a coffee from Colombia. Uh, I would contact several importers and try to get samples from several of them to, 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 so that I can compare the qualities. Because um, in a, any given cupping table, uh, as a seller, it's easy to sell coffee. Because let's say you have a coffee that you really want to get rid of that is not performing well and you're, you're scoring it maybe 84 points, for instance. And uh, in order to make that coffee shine, you can just put it on a table with coffees that are scoring between 80 and 82 points. And an unexperienced buyer will immediately pick out the best coffee, even though it's just an 84 point coffee and say, wow, this is fantastic, I'll buy it, you know? So I'm not saying that that's how it happens, but it's, it's difficult to assess quality, even for, for me that I, I are doing it quite often. I, I like to have some kind of reference on the table uh, whether it's, you know, coffee from the same country that you kind of know the quality of or, or from a different country where you know the quality of. But um, so that's the technique that I would highly recommend roasters to use when they buy coffee. But, uh, you know, for, more importantly for me, like quality is not just what you taste in the cup. Quality for me is knowing that the coffee was bought in a fair way and that it was grown in a good way uh, and produced in a good way by people who are nice, you know? So um, the more knowledge you can get about the coffee, the better, I think. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, so if a roaster cannot come to the origin, what I will say is do contact, uh, basically what Tim says, um, well, it depends. If, it, if the roaster wants to buy directly from, from the exporter, um, what I will say is ask the people you know in the industry if they're already buying from some exporter. Because at the end, it's that, that gives you some level of confidence that, okay, I should be buying from this exporter. But also, once you contact the exporters you feel like you could be working with, uh, ask them how do, how do they do their, their job? Uh, if it's important for, for them to be transparent with the farmer, even if they're willing to show you how much you're paying to the farmer, even if they're willing to show you uh, how much does it cost the whole chain to put the coffee there. Uh, because at the end, if you want to have consistent coffee, good coffee uh, every year, well, you need to work with an exporter that is going to have a consistent, stable relationship with the farmers. Because otherwise, this exporter will offer you something this year, the next year will offer you something different, and that might not be but I mean, from the coffee shop point of view or the roasting or, or the roaster point of view, you invest in marketing, you invest in positioning a farm. Uh, so for you to be changing like all your coffee all the time, it's, it's not good. Another thing I will say to roasters is understand what you're buying. If you want the crazy anaerobic yeast carbonic maceration, whatever, you need to understand that it won't look like a washed coffee. When you receive the coffee, even if after, before if you receive the sample, you need to understand how it's going to look. And in, in, when you're roasting that coffee, you need to be open-minded. I've seen some people that they roast every coffee the same way. And that's just crazy. Because for example, if you have one of these really fermented coffees. Just to give you an example, here in, in my machine, a yeast, this, is, this sounds ridiculous, but last week I was, I was roasting a yeast anaerobic carbonic maceration, something like super, 
It was just, it's just ridiculous. And I did like uh, a rose profile and born. Second rose profile, born. And then I say, okay, I need to be open-minded here. I, I will leave this coffee just 50 seconds in the crack. I did that and the coffee was amazing. So you need to be really open-minded about not having recipes for, for all the coffee because if you receive the coffee and you just roast it based on a recipe, well, you probably won't get the result you're expecting. Uh, so this I will say, or this I will recommend to the roasters who are not uh, willing or they cannot travel to the origin. Thank you, thank you, Danielle. Ian. Yeah, um, obviously uh, having the capacity to travel to uh, origin to meet with uh, the people who are producing your coffee is, is fantastic. I think that uh, you don't have, you don't absolutely have to do that or be able to do that COVID or not. Um, or at least I think there are a number of things that should be happening in advance to that. Um, having, having a reference is, is really great. Um, we, we put a, we put a 80 point, um, reference on the front of every coffee table, uh, every cupping table that we taste, we start with a reference and that reference is the same. It's the same roast. It's the same coffee. Um, every single time. And we, we use that because humans, uh, humans are really good at comparing things and we are much, much less good at just tasting one thing and saying, this is what it is. We can say this is X amount more sweet than this. And we can do that very well, but we can't just taste the target and say, this is X amount sweet. Uh, so we, we definitely uh, use a reference and that's easy to do. And it, the reference could really be anything that you agree on. It, you know, it could be an 80 point coffee. It could be a 90 point coffee. It could be anything comparable that can be prepared consistently that you can then compare everything else to. That's very, very helpful. Um, the other thing that is really a, a key practice and really super helpful is to have protocols within your uh, tasting program within your cupping program. The protocols help to eliminate variability. Uh, they allow you to know that when you taste a, a target coffee, uh, the data that you're producing, uh, the descriptions, the scores, the differences that you're finding in that coffee from something else, uh, they allow you to know that it's that coffee that is different and not something that you did along the way. Right. If you have different protocols every day, if you sometimes you cup like this and sometimes you do like that, uh, you actually don't know if it's the coffee that's different or you or what you did that's different. So your protocols are all aimed at um, isolating differences found on the cupping table to the coffee itself. Uh, Within that, and this part gets a little bit more challenging within the protocols, one that is extremely important is blinding. Um, if you know what the coffee is, you will um, score it and describe it to what you think it is. That's just that's just a rule. That counts for everybody that's humans. If you're a human being and you're assessing coffee, that will happen. Um, you can resist it, you can fight it, but it will, it will happen. So you need to blind and, um, and not know what you're tasting. Beyond that, having replication, right? So Tim mentioned tasting coffees um, at different points along, along, the, along the chain, maybe um, different days of the week kind of a thing. Uh, that's another thing that what we'll do is we won't just set up a, a flight of coffees. We'll set up a flight of coffees and coffee A will appear in two or three locations and they'll be coded separately so that we don't know that that's coffee A again and again and again. Um, that gives us more data points. That gives us the ability to get a broader picture of what that coffee really is, right? Um, I think, especially from a roaster's perspective, um, and as important for us as an importer, uh, and as important for Daniel as an exporter, uh, the 
the language that we use is cupping form, but really the questions that we're asking of coffee when we're cupping, uh, they need to be aimed at the answers that we want or the answers that we need. So if you're a roaster, you, you should have different questions than I have as an importer. And I'm gonna have different questions than Daniel is as an exporter. Uh, there might be overlap, there might be more and less overlap, but the questions that I ask when I'm cupping coffee are, well, they're gonna determine the answers that I get. Um, and so if we all are trying to use the exact same, the exact same cupping form, the exact same tools, probably none of us are gonna really get the answers that we really wanna have. Uh, so you, you need to know what the answers you want are. You need to know what the answers that you need are. You need to then ask the right, the appropriate questions for that. Even if we're using the same cupping form, right? You need to approach that cupping form knowing what you're actually trying to find out. Otherwise you're just generating information that um, is not particularly helpful. Um, I see. So there you go. There's maybe uh, there's maybe three things that that I think will help with uh, some QC at that level. A lot of great advices. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, team Ian and Daniel. It was very insightful.